through some of these things in more detail. So, I, in addition to the general things that I gave in your feedback, I wanted to point to some overall trends, things that I think people did well and should continue to focus on going forward. One thing that I really liked in the essays was that just about all of them did a really good job in the introduction and conclusion paragraphs of essentially previewing and telling me what you were going to tell me in the essay, uh, and then using the conclusion as a way of recapping the main points. So there were a lot of essays that said, in this essay, or here we'll be exploring the issue of social penetration theory and nonverbal communication in the TV show House. So that was a good way for you to help the reader follow along. One way to think about this right, is that the reader um, is not in your head. They don't know why your essay is structured the way it is. They don't know the major arguments or ideas that you're presenting in the same way that you do. So sometimes it can feel a little handholdy, but it's helpful to really guide the reader through um, in that way. So I thought people did a great job there. I think overall, people did a good job of citing and using sources throughout the essay. I really appreciate it, the way that uh, people were really careful about citing sources, both in text and through the work cited list. There were some um, issues that came up here and there, but I think overall uh, people did a good job uh, of including the quoted material, material from the show or movie, and were able to use one of the citation styles uh, effectively. Again, citing sources, if it's not something you've done a lot before, it's kind of like riding a bike. Um, it kind of is annoying, you fall off the first couple times, Great, but once you get it down, right, it's something that will help you a lot for uh, the entire rest of your college experience. So I recommend keeping at it if you ran into some issues there. And I really liked the concepts and ideas that people identify within the course. People picked some really relevant uh, things. Again, a lot of the theories like uncertainty reduction, social penetration came up. I also liked the ways that people brought in things like nonverbal communication. There were really relevant things, and I really liked the way that there was a clear reason why you chose those ideas for that episode. Uh, it was a good way for you to show what you need. Some things to keep working on. So as you're gearing up for the final essay, remember the content-wise, you're essentially doing some pretty similar things to what you already did. So this final essay is uh, pretty analytical, where I'm, instead of a TV episode or film asking you to basically take the transcribed conversation and use that in order to discuss what you notice about your communication, communication with the other person, and so on. You might tie that back to family communication, friendship communication, um, romantic communication, and some of the other things that we've been working on. So some things to keep working on. So um, I noticed that there were some paragraphs and essays where it would kind of go out with defining the term and having like a good quote, um, showing an example from the TV episode or film, and then like the last sentence or two would put those two things together and have like a link. And I remember when I'd see essays like that, I'd think to myself, oh, you're starting the analysis, and then the paragraph's over. So. One of the things to really focus on is, now that you've defined the episode or example, now that you've defined the term or concept in the course, really showing how those two things fit together. So, um, now that you understand nonverbal communication that's at play in friends, we understand that because there's oftentimes a lot of contradicting styles, uh, people who say one thing and mean another, that there's a lack of trust, that there's a lot of uh, subtext and a lot of things hidden in the relationship. This shows us that the two characters are experiencing a lot of discomfort and are not uh, feeling good about disclosing with each other. Like going into more detail about what we've learned by putting these two pieces together is something to continue to focus on for a lot of us. Another thing here um, that kind of goes hand in hand is continuing to dive a bit deeper into some of the concepts from the course that you've used. For instance, a lot of people brought in nonverbal communication. One way to expand on this is to talk about some of the functions, things like complementing, substituting, contradicting, and so on. So you've shown there's nonverbal communication at play. Okay, what is this nonverbal communication doing? How is it impacting the relationship? 
So if you find yourself like needing to fill in more space um, or not quite meeting a page limit, right? There's probably more at play in the term that you choose then that you can pick up. For instance, under social penetration theory, you might recall the three different layers, periphery, intermediate, and central. And you can talk about how these layers are evident in the relationship and the way that it develops over time. And then there were some uh, convention and grammar issues that were fairly minor. Um, I just give you the rule of thumb, give yourself 24 hours away and try to look at it again with a fresh pair of eyes. You might also enlist some outside help, like the Writing Center, if you're struggling with conventions. Uh, one kind of thing that I noticed a lot, where there are a lot of essays that used second person pronouns. So for instance, we or you. Um, I encourage you to avoid those in essays whenever you can. Um, first person is fine, right? You're saying I'm arguing, or third person is fine, as essay argues. But second person can be tricky because um, you don't know who your audience is. You don't know the person that you're directly speaking to. If you're doing an instruction manual, you'll hear second person, right? You bought this um, IKEA furniture that's gonna fall apart in two weeks, so you get to see the steps. It makes sense in an instruction manual, but it wouldn't make sense for something like an essay like this. So try to avoid second person. It happens to you a lot. Um, you might control out your use of we, you, and so on. So, talking a little bit more about this final essay. Uh, the recording and reflection essay is due December 16th at midnight, giving you just under three weeks from now to work on, brainstorm, and think through uh, this assignment. I'm asking you to do four pages, double space, uh, so the same amount of content as you did for your interpersonal analysis essay. In addition to, so not counting toward those four pages, I'm asking you to include a transcription of your conversation with that other person and then to have a work cited page that would cite from the wrench textbook. So, um, in other words, four pages of your own analysis and reflection, the transcription, which um, will probably range in length depending on how long the conversation goes, and then the work cited. Um, I do not need the recording itself, so you don't have to submit like an audio or video. Um, also, your conversation does not need to be recorded through video. You could just use audio if you wanted to. Um, it also doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. So if you decide to record something like a phone conversation or something through Zoom or Skype, you can do that too. Um, but I encourage you, uh, and part of you, to use, um, provide advance consent with that person and say, hey, before we start this conversation, I'm recording this for a class. Is it okay if I use this? Uh, one tactic that sometimes works is you might offer to make it anonymous or use like a pseudonym or fake name uh, to somebody else. But please check in with advance with that person before you do it. Please do not record a conversation and say, hey, I've secretly recorded a conversation with you that I want to use for my paper. So please don't do that. Once you've done that, right, um, you can draw from some of the things you've talked about for the back half of the class um, and reflect on some of the things that you've learned through your communication in this process. So I definitely uh, recommend that just like with the previous essay, you can reach out to me with outlines. Uh, if you're stuck and need some help and so on, I'm happy to work with you. You might start by picking that person, which you've started to do for today. Um, it should be somebody who thinks is important to you, right? Um, they need to agree, and it could be a lot of different topics. Their life experiences, um, their social perspectives. If you're figuring out, trying to think through your topic, one way to do this is to think about the intermediate and central layers of social penetration theory. You might recall in those layers, people talk about issues such as you know, their goals, their challenges, their beliefs. So you might think about somebody that you're comfortable having those intermediate and central conversations with. Transcribing, so use the direct dialogue here. Don't paraphrase, um, include the full conversation, including the ums, the uhs, and so on. In fact, a lot of verbal fillers are useful things to help us better understand what's happening in the conversation. So ver verbal fillers maybe came up when you got anxious or you weren't sure what to say or how to say it. That's something you can use to help you better understand your own listening. 
And then, like with the first essay, you can pick two to three relevant concepts from the back half of the quarter. Uh, and then, once you've done kind of those initial steps, you can start to outline the organize. So, some general tips that I'll give you as you're working through this. Um, first of all, uh, here's an example. I know the text is really small. It's a lot easier uh, after class if you take a look at the slides here. Um, but it does have kind of like a stage play, right? Where you have the person, you have the direct line that they're saying, you have the other person, and so on. Uh, so going for a style that's a direct uh, conversation between the two that's transcribed is the way to go here. So um, for my research, I transcribed 30 interviews that were anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour in length. And doing that, I can tell you that transcription takes time, right? At the very least, it will take double the amount of uh, length that your actual conversation or recording is. Um, that's because, unless you're a really fast typist, um, you're probably going to have to go back through parts over and over again or um, change your recording uh, playback speed to slower so that you can fully pick up on that. Uh, again, drafts and outlines can help. Setting up a schedule to complete the assignment. So by this Friday, I'm going to identify my person. By this Monday, I'm going to recap this person. Uh, set up your time and topic in advance, right? I recommend at least a week, ideally more, uh, to have that conversation. Um, and it's okay if the conversation is longer uh, than that 15 minute window. So if you have more content, uh, you can always pick out a part of that conversation that you want to use for your essay. So, any questions about that at this point? So, I thought that the discussion group did a great job of going over some of the key elements of friendships. I just want to hit on a couple um, additional ideas that can help us to better understand the roles of friends in communication and interpersonal communication specifically. And these slides will be up for you after class to help in understanding these concepts a bit more. So, the idea, uh, as Alexis did a great job of overviewing, is that conversations with friends oftentimes are voluntary, they're open, they're mutual. This idea of conversations with friends being affective means that we are to some degree moved or impacted uh, by the relationship. One of the challenges that a lot of young people have reported, whether it be folks in college or you know, uh, folks as they navigate adulthood, is that it can be difficult to maintain and build new friendships with a lot of the connections and relationships to make those friends are a lot more limited. So for instance, maybe you're working remotely, you have fewer interactions with coworkers, you're not connecting with people through school in the same way. These are challenges that we can readily deal with when it comes to building and maintaining friendships over time. So like before the class, um, friendships deal with dialectical tensions. In fact, many of these are the same issues that we brought up with romantic relationships, where we want one thing and another at the same time. Uh, so again, we either want uh, a relationship with a friend to be private and just shared with that person. We also like the idea that people know that we have friends. And um, it's public as well and shared with other people. So um, you don't need to know verbatim these different uh, tensions that we deal with with friendships, just to know that just like with romantic relationships, we struggle to understand how our friends can fit in some of the major things that we like. So um, the discussion group also did a really great job here of talking through maybe seven, seven different stages. So these really look like the 10 relationship stages of breaking apart and coming together. Right, where either you have casual conversation with other people that slowly develops toward a good friendship. And uh, as many of us might know, through things like childhood friends, our friendships can fade over time too. So we might not be friends with somebody as regularly anymore, but maybe we're still in contact with them through social media, we still see them on holidays, and that sort of thing. So that identifying the stage of a friendship helps us to identify the different communication patterns that might emerge. For instance, in a more stabilized friendship, we see a lot more of the deeper layers of social penetration theory. Uh, and in these kind of later stages, there might be familiarity, but also a lot of distance in the topics or issues that are covered. 
So if you're having a conversation with a friend for your final essay, you might think about what you and that friend are in in your state. So um, this kind of quadrant here of friendships based on their health or lack of health, right, is a good way of visualizing and understanding uh, different friendships. That a friendship can be healthy but not enjoyable just means that it's fading out over time, that it doesn't have the same spark that it used to. An ideal friendship, something that you both enjoy and something that feels uh, kind of healthy to you. This is somebody that you can bounce up ideas, you can vent, you can feel supported with. A deviant friendship is both unhealthy um, and not very enjoyable. Maybe it's somebody that you feel like you've been stuck with over time. Uh, that could be an example of a deviant friendship, which oftentimes don't last. And then a problematic friendship, right, is the type of person that you enjoy spending time with, uh, but you know is not necessarily particularly healthy. Right? So, um, you know, maybe you go out and you stay really late at night, and um, you feel a lot of peer pressure from them, right? That could fit under that category. So, um, problematic friendships are kind of the toxic style of friendship that you might see. If you've ever seen uh, Friends with Benefits or uh, some of the recent discussions surrounding the challenges of uh, friendships versus romantic relationships versus all the arrangements in between, right? Um, in recent years, the concept of a friend with benefits with a uh, relationship that's platonic uh, but involves um, kind of like uh, sexual activity, right, but is not meant to be a relationship, is an example of some of the complications that have emerged and how the friendships have developed over time. So as the discussion group brought up, a lot of the challenges that we face with friendships can deal with things like romantic and sexual attraction. What does it mean if we're friends with somebody and maybe some feelings exist, right? Um, that gets talked about a lot in terms of uh, boundaries and understandings between people. How might a friendship that's entirely platonic be coded to other people? So for instance, um, two people who might uh, to some be seen as a couple, but are instead just really good friends, um, are things that we see a lot, and we see a lot of miscommunication about. Things like technology, including remote friendships and connections that can develop over time, uh, play a pretty big role too. And the ways that things such as culture play into friendships as well is an important idea. As we brought up earlier in the quarter, the way that friendships can be expressed physically, putting your arm over somebody's shoulder and something else look really different uh, and be coded really differently somewhere like Western Europe compared to the United States. So these are some questions to continue to think about as we build further on our discussion and application of relationships and friendships, family, and so on. So to wrap up for today, again, this final essay is due on December 16th. Um, we talked a little bit about friendships, and the discussion group did a great job of helping us think about the ways that friendship relates to communication. So for next class, we'll look at family communication in a bit more detail. If you have concerns about your essay, would like to chat to me about your grade, uh, just set up a time, and I'm happy to meet with you. Uh, welcome back. I hope you have a great rest of your Monday. And please pass forward your attendance activities for today, or email them to me. And I will see you next class.